Good morning, uh, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, a very warm welcome to our Honeywell Avionics Technical Webinar for 2022. I just want to again welcome to all of our airline customers that have registered for today's event. Uh, we certainly have uh, an extensive agenda to run through of topics that are relevant to all of our Honeywell Avionics issues. Uh, and those topics uh, in order and agenda is set uh, as today. So we will be running off with the um, RDR 4000 operational introduction from our uh, technical pilot, Steve Hammack. And then we'll be talking about the RDR 4000 hardware and software reliability updates. That'll be led by Bob Miller. And then we'll be moving into our transponder TRA 100B technical investigation update, which will also be led by Bob Miller. Then we'll be talking about the FDR slash CVR investigation update, also led by Bob Miller. Then we'll be moving into gyro wear out, which will be a discussion from Mark Lyles. And then we'll conclude the um, presentation with a short update on our product reliability page um, on the MyRospace portal. Um, so again, a very warm welcome. Today's event will be recorded. So if for whatever reason you would like to watch a replay of the presentation, then that will be available. We will send a link. Uh, typically that occurs uh, between uh, 24 hours after the event. And once you click on that link, you'll be able to review and watch this entire presentation in its entirety. And uh, my name is Chris Vandeleur. I lead our Honeywell field service team for the Asia Pacific region. And on behalf of our Honeywell team, it's a very warm welcome to today's presentation. So Andrew, let's start off with the first topic, please. Okay, Chris. Welcome. I'm Steve Hammack from Honeywell's Flight Technical Services Group, and today I'm going to provide a short overview on understanding and operating the RDR 4000 system. We'll start with a short comparison to conventional tilt-based radar. In training, I always say it's easier to use, but it's different, and understanding those differences and what the system is trying to show you are important. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the antenna sweep and what you see on the display on a conventional tilt-based radar. We generally recommend pilots use the cruise ground park technique, or a lot of training refers to this as setting up a protection zone. It isn't going to show the maximum reflectivity. If something is in your path, it may need analysis for an avoidance decision. This technique is lowering the beam until you see ground returns at the outer edge of the display. There's two benefits to this. As a storm cell walks through the beam, comes out of the ground returns, it's very easily seen. And if you can still see ground returns behind the cell, then you know you don't have a radar shadow or attenuation. Then the pilots look at the colors to make a deviation decision. But a better question is why do we look at the colors? We look at the colors because studies have shown us that with higher levels of reflectivity comes higher probabilities of turbulence and hail size. For example, here, if we enter the chart at 40 dBZ, which is the beginning of red, we see that we have about a 40% chance of moderate turbulence and about a 5% chance of severe turbulence. And But if you look, this chart is for convective weather, so you first have to determine that you're dealing with convective weather and not stratiform weather for the chart to apply. Well, that relationship isn't as direct as we want, but I'll give you a 100% guarantee that if you fly through this, that you will encounter turbulence. And this is what we really need to use the radar to do, is to detect convective activity. And we use that by looking at the height of a cell and how much reflectivity is carried aloft. And we've known this. Just about every pilot guide that I've ever seen has, has information that talks about this. It says, avoid all cells containing yellow or red, that's from the chart we just saw, or turbulence indications because they're a direct measurement by at least 20 nautical miles. If the cell exceeds 28,000 feet, it doesn't matter what color it is, avoid it by 20 nautical miles. And if it exceeds 35,000 feet, then give it some additional separation in addition to the 20 nautical miles. So we've always known that altitude is important and probably more important than the color. So that's why I say the system is easier to use, but it's different. And think about altitude first and then color. 
We call this the RDR 4000 a 3D radar. That third dimension we're giving you is altitude. As we go through the description of the RDR 4000, notice how most of the modes convey altitude information to you. So again, think about altitude first and then color. Now we'll look at the heart of the system, the 3D volumetric buffer. We'll start with a quick review of what information goes into the buffer. But first, what is a buffer? A buffer is just a storage area for information. We store the information the radar collects in a memory organized in three dimensions, latitude, longitude, and altitude. For each location in the 3D buffer, we store associated information like range, reflectivity, turbulence, and if the returns came from weather or ground. The system automatically and continuously scans and collects weather and ground returns from the nose of the aircraft up to 320 nautical miles and from the ground to 60,000 feet. For scans above the freezing level, the system automatically increases the gain to make less reflective frozen storm tops more visible. The scanned information is stored in the 3D volumetric buffer and is continuously updated and compensated for aircraft movement. The data is also corrected for the Earth's curvature, so the altitudes displayed by the system are true MSL altitudes. If left uncorrected, the effect of the Earth's curvature can be quite significant. In the picture shown, the aircraft is at flight level 250. However, because of the Earth's curvature, the center of the beam is above 27,000 feet at 60 nautical miles, almost 37,000 feet at 120 nautical miles, and 44,000 feet at 150 nautical miles. The automatic scanning stores all the weather and ground return information in the 3D buffer memory. The system also contains an internal worldwide terrain database that is a version of our EGPWS database, but without airports, runways, and obstacles. Because the system uses only the terrain information, regularly scheduled updates are not required. The terrain database allows the radar to distinguish between weather and ground returns, so we can then display only weather information in the weather mode and only ground returns in the ground map mode. In the ground map mode, the ground returns are provided by the radar returns and not the internal terrain database. This allows for an independent verification of position. Other information put into the 3D buffer includes enhanced turbulence data. Turbulence data is provided out to 40 or 60 nautical miles for any range selection, depending on the system. The new enhanced turbulence detection provides more sensitive and accurate turbulence information with fewer false alerts and improved correlation to predicted aircraft G-forces. It is up to 12 times more sensitive than current systems. We now have a complete picture of the environment and of the aircraft and can analyze the information in the buffer to detect wind shear, turbulence, provide cell growth, movement and attenuation information, and to predict areas containing hail and lightning. Since there is no tilt control, the pilot is not using the control panel to control the radar, but rather using it to request information from the 3D buffer. This is what allows our system to provide pilots with independent selections of range, mode, gain, and altitude slices. This information can be presented in many ways, including comparing the buffer data, the aircraft's flight plan, and displaying the weather on the flight path in solid colors as shown here, and weather outside the flight path displayed in a hash pattern as shown here. The pilot can also extract earth curvature corrected altitude slices from the buffer and display them. Here we have the same storm cell with slices extracted at 12,000 feet and 22,000 feet. This analysis mode provides a simple means for making deviation decisions. So now let's take a peek into the 3D volumetric buffer. This is the two-dimensional plan view radar display that you normally see, but this is what's inside the 3D volumetric buffer that makes up that display. This is a snapshot in time from an actual flight. We collect and store everything providing live, continuously updated information. This 3D volumetric scan is more robust for handling varying geographic conditions and detecting hazards close to the aircraft. The returns are classified as weather or ground, so we can remove the ground returns, leaving just the weather, or remove the weather, just leaving the ground map. Let's peel the layers of these cells away like the layers of an onion. Removing green leaves yellow and red reflectivity along with turbulence information. Removing yellow shows the highest reflectivity red and turbulent areas. Removing the red leaves only the turbulence information. The turbulence threshold is set for moderate turbulence, but the actual values are stored in the buffer, so we can set the threshold for lower turbulence values or increase the threshold to show stronger turbulence. You can see here we are heading very close to an area of strong turbulence. 
You can't peel away the layers like this, but you still have some very powerful tools available for making deviation decisions. Let's put all the colors back so we can look at constant altitude slices. These have been corrected for the Earth's curvature, and that's why we call them constant altitude slices. Looking at the 3D view, we can see three areas with higher tops. This mode provides an easy analysis mode for making deviation decisions, allowing you to look at cell heights and how much moisture is carried aloft. We start out at our current aircraft altitude of 21,000 feet. Going up, we see that most of the reflectivity is gone by 30,000 feet, and we're left with the three taller cells. The first one disappears by 34,000 feet. The second by 42,000 feet and the third by 46,000 feet. As mentioned, you're not controlling the antenna, but rather using the control panel to request information from the 3D volumetric buffer. That's what allows independent selections of modes, ranges, altitude, slices, and gain. The raw data is placed in the buffer and continuously gets updated and motion compensated, but it doesn't get changed based on your mode selection. What we're doing is you're using the control panel if one side wants auto and one side wants altitude slices. We're requesting information from the buffer. We process it for the display, but it doesn't change the raw data in the buffer. But again, that's what allows us to provide all these independent uh, mode, gain, range, uh, altitude slices, etc. The other neat thing is that the 3D buffer is larger than the displayed area. So as you're maneuvering on a SID or star or around the terminal area as you turn, there may already be information in the buffer. The same thing as you taxi around before takeoff. The system is collecting data and may have data already along your departure path. Of course, this information eventually times out. This picture is from uh, one aircraft that actually has a 360 rose mode where we can show weather all around the aircraft. Now we'll look at the operational modes the system provides and always break weather usage into detection and analysis if needed for avoidance. In auto mode, we compare the weather in the buffer to an envelope placed around the aircraft. We use the vertical flight plan or vertical flight path. I'll say this now and again in a minute, but all you need to understand is the concept that this envelope is based on the flight path. I'm giving you the details so you understand it, but you don't need to memorize any of it. Just understand the principle. Vertical flight path is based on the vertical rate and ground speed and then extrapolated out to 60 nautical miles, and that altitude is used from there on out. The images describe the envelope. It looks kind of confusing, but it's really very straightforward. The nominal envelope is plus and minus 4,000 feet around the flight path. Let's look at it graphically for a second first. Here, our translucent wedge indicates plus and minus 4,000 feet around the aircraft. We're flying along straight and level, and where that flight path intercepts the weather, it's shown on the display in the solid pattern. Over here, we have some low-lying weather below our envelope, and it's shown, but it's shown in a different crosshatch pattern. So the nominal envelope, as mentioned, is plus or minus 4,000 feet above the aircraft. And there's an upper and lower, which is the upper and lower envelope boundary. And we do a couple of modifications. The first one is, is the upper envelope boundary never goes below 10,000 feet. So anytime you're less than 6,000 feet, the upper envelope boundary is always at 10,000 feet, All right? And that's to give you about 10 minutes look ahead during takeoff and climb and also during uh, descent, approach, and landing. As you get up above 6,000 feet, the envelope is 4,000 feet above you all the way up to your final cruise altitude. Where most of the modifications take place is on the lower envelope boundary. And in Again, nominally, it's minus 4,000 feet below your flight path. But we make one modification. Where we detect convective activity, we lower that lower boundary to 25,000 feet. And the reason for that is you can see here, if you were up at cruise altitude, and we just showed you the weather that was up here around your cruise altitude, it would just show up as, as green on the display. It wouldn't be very attention-getting, but 
even though this cell is pushing up to, you know, over 40,000 feet into the atmosphere. By looking down into the 25,000 feet, you can see here we have yellow and red on the display. And what we do is we provide a maximum reflectivity indication. So for any point on the display, we show the maximum reflectivity. So in this case, red would be shown on the display. This is just showing you a different way. If here's our flight path and we come across convective weather. We lower the floor down to 25,000 feet, showing you the lower, more reflective part of the storm. And it also helps uh, filter out stratus um, layers as well. Now, on some of the aircraft, there's a selection where you can show just you can show all weather or path weather, and that also helps you declutter stratus weather that might be above you or below you. You can also do this manually by selecting an altitude slice four to 5,000 feet below you. Now you're going to be in auto mode most of the time, and sometimes you'll see a clear path and no analysis for deviation is needed. And other times it'll be obvious a deviation is needed and also to wear. But sometimes you need to to do some analysis to determine if you need to deviate and where. And that's one of the benefits of the RDR 4000. It provides an analysis mode to help you make a deviation decision. And that is constant altitude slices or altitude mode or man mode. Okay. And what this does is provide a laser thin slice through the 3D buffer that you select. It's corrected for the Earth's curvature. The initial slice is at the current aircraft altitude, and then you can dial up or down from zero to 60,000 feet in 1,000 foot increments. If you climb or descend, it'll maintain your selected altitude, and nothing is presented for those parts of, of uh, below ground. This is the same area of weather with a slice at 14,000 feet and a slice at 27,000 feet. So here, even though you have large area of weather, you can clearly see a deviation path through the weather. Here we see auto mode on the left and an altitude slice at 22,000 feet on the right. But let's look at some tougher examples in just a second and using the altitude slices for analysis. We're gonna be looking at how much reflectivity is carried aloft Think of a garden fountain and a much larger fountain in the lake at a nearby park. The larger fountain has a larger pump. Our storm cells are like that. We're trying to determine if our pump or updrafts are like the small garden fountain or the much larger one. The stronger updrafts cause stronger downdrafts and turbulence. We'll do this by looking at the reflectivity of different altitude slices. Typically, the more moisture that is carried aloft above the freezing level, the more dangerous the cell is. In addition, in a minute, we'll talk about some additional clues like attenuation, turbulence, hail, and lightning. But vertical profile also gives you a good indication of how much reflectivity is carried aloft. I say vertical profile is like a combined detection and analysis mode. The only difference is it's, it's provided along a single slice, where as the altitude slices are for the entire plan view of the display. So I'm not going to go through this example. Uh, you can Google this. Uh, you can Google analysis using constant altitude slices or enter this link. But it's good to walk through this example. Uh, this one shows some low-lying weather. And we're going to be looking at these cells headed aircraft. But there's some stratiform weather off to the left. And as you get closer and closer, and we're analyzing this in auto mode and looking at altitude slices, you might think that the cell on the left is the one that's more dangerous. But as we start looking at it, the cell on the right is actually the one that's carrying more reflectivity aloft and is more dangerous. And you can start to see that as you get closer and closer. And as you get into the range where you can detect turbulence, you can see that the cell on the right is really the only one that we need to worry about. And there's actually a clear deviation path through there. One other mode that we have is REAC or rain echo attenuation compensation technique and it indicates areas of attenuation or radar shadows. And the nice thing about this and if you've used a feature like this before is they generally just show you where the attenuation is and the azimuth of that attenuation. But like in this example where you don't have as strong of a cell here, it's not only just showing you the azimuth, but it's actually showing you where the magenta begins. That's where you run out of color calibration. So up to that point, your display is still calibrated. 
The turbulence detection on this radar is exceptionally good, and it's out to 40 or 60 nautical miles, depending on the installation. In auto mode, it's plus minus 4,000 feet around the aircraft. And in altitude mode, it's for the selected slice. It provides fewer false indications, uh, increased detection accuracy. It's up to 12 times more sensitive than conventional radars, and better correlation between turbulence and the predicted G-forces. And it's more of uh, magenta blocks, makes it easier to see uh, in high brightness uh, situations. One of the other great things about the 3D buffer is we have a database of live storm cell information that we can analyze to predict conditions conducive to the development of other weather hazards. By looking at vertical columns of the weather throughout the 3D buffer, we can find areas of convection. Then applying additional information, such as altitude and intensity of reflectivity, we can predict areas that are likely to produce hail and or lightning. These are then presented on display as icons indicating the range and azimuth is shown. Hail and lightning icons are shown out to 160 nautical miles and, in, and indicate that conditions are conducive to the development of hail and or lightning. This provides additional information to aid you in making a deviation decision. I mentioned vertical profile before and on aircraft that have the vertical profile display, they typically have three uh, different modes. You can see uh, the weather along your track. You can, if you have an area of interest that you want to look at the weather, you can do a selected azimuth to the left or to the right. And the last one is really neat. If you have a dog leg flight plan, it'll show you the weather in the vertical profile view as if it were a straight path. So it's very easy to see the vertical extent of cells and how much reflectivity is carried aloft. So now we'll look at some in-service experience or, or questions and things that we've received from operators. So let's look at a couple things that are often misunderstood about X-band weather radar systems. This isn't really any different from legacy radar, but a, pilots, a lot of pilots think that the radar should detect these. But radars are designed to reflect off of water droplets of sufficient size and quantity. They do not detect water vapor, clouds, fog, volcanic ash, or extremely dry hail and snow. Rain, wet hail, and wet snow are very good reflectors of radar energy, but dry hail, for example, only returns about 3% of the energy that a raindrop does. At times, pilots may see a cloud mass and think that it should be shown on the radar display. Large, white, puffy clouds may be a developing storm cell, but they will not show on the radar until there is a sufficient size and quantity of water droplets available. Somewhat less obvious, immediately after a storm cell is dissipated and little to no rain is falling, a dark cloud mass may still exist that hasn't broken up yet due to the wind. The pilot can try increasing the gain to see if they're just below the green threshold, but there may not be enough reflectivity available. Another item related to reflectivity that pilots observed when they first started using the new system was magenta turbulence indications in black areas. The reflectivity chart in the picture illustrates that black doesn't mean it's not raining. It's just raining at a rate below the threshold, the FAA set for green, which is 20 dBZ. With older radars, to detect turbulence below the green threshold, the radar would need to be about three nautical miles away from the turbulence in order to see it in black reflectivity. Because the RDR 4000 is much more sensitive, it can detect turbulence at the same reflectivity level from about 15 nautical miles away. The turbulence detection capability on this radar is much more sensitive and accurate, so keep it turned on and learn to trust it. The new digital radar systems on the market today provide many benefits in terms of ease of use and enhanced situational awareness, but they are still subject to the same laws of physics as their predecessors. So as we use the system, we need to keep these limitations in mind. A good way to understand the limitations is to break them down by distance or range. At long ranges, the beam is extremely large, so everything will be shown as flight path weather since there is an adequate resolution to separate it into flight path and secondary. But again, this should not be an issue because at this distance, the weather should only be considered strategically. As the weather gets closer, it will separate into flight path and secondary weather and provide adequate resolution for analysis. Recall that all radars are subject to line of sight limitations. The red area in this picture shows where the radar's energy is blocked beyond the horizon due to the Earth's curvature. The radar line of sight, or radar horizon, 
varies with altitude and is approximately 200 nautical miles at 26,000 feet and 250 nautical miles at 41,000 feet. Even though the radar energy is blocked, we can use this to our advantage. At long ranges beyond the radar horizon, the radar is only seeing weather at high altitudes due to the Earth's shadowing. So any visible weather is likely to be a cell reaching very high altitudes. The beam is expanded, so cells appear larger than they really are. The expanded beam cannot see the details of the cell and will likely show only green or yellow, even if there is a red core. All weather appears as on path because the beam width is so large, it cannot resolve altitudes accurately. Here we know the cell is big, but we're just monitoring the situation because they are farther away. Anything that shows up beyond the radar line of sight is significant and should be monitored. But at this distance, deviation decisions aren't being made. The weather at this range should be viewed on a more strategic basis. By the time the aircraft reaches these cells, they may have moved into or out of the flight path, increased or decreased in intensity, or completely dissipated. At long ranges, all the pilot knows is that they are worth monitoring. At intermediate ranges between 120 and 220 nautical miles, there is no shadowing effect. However, the beam is still rather large and the weather appears very close to the horizon, making it difficult to separate low-lying weather from ground clutter. So stratus is generally not seen at all in these areas. The weather shown in the previous slide that is beyond the radar horizon is tracked and used in algorithms to weight returns in favor of being classified as weather. If you turn the radar off at this time, you will lose that history and weather previously classified as weather may be classified as ground and the picture may look different. Tall cells are easily seen and start to show better definition. The beam is still 30 to 60,000 feet tall, so they will mostly show up as yellow and green because it is an average of the energy of the entire beam width and any red cores are likely to be much smaller than the beam at this range. All weather appears as on path because the beam still cannot resolve altitude sufficiently. Within 120 nautical miles, the beam width is narrow and we begin to see separation between on and off path weather and it continues to improve as we get closer. Stratus will become visible around this range, depending on its altitude. Stratus weather may extend beyond 120 nautical miles and will show us on path at longer ranges and transition to off path when the geometry of the aircraft, weather, and beam allow good altitude resolution, usually around 80 nautical miles. Cells will begin to show red cores when present due to the increased resolution and embedded cells can be seen separate from stratus layers. Let's look at an example that will help you evaluate cells. This is probably what we get the most questions about now. The system is doing exactly as intended, but many pilots think because they see a cloud that they should see strong reflectivity on path. With a conventional radar, they would tilt down and see yellow and red, but not know where the reflectivity is in altitude. Looking at the cell just to the left of heading at about 10 miles, the display is showing red off-path weather. The display is enunciating VAR on a Boeing display, which means the gain is not in the calibrated position. So with the gain turned up and the cell at a close range, there is not even green on-path reflectivity displayed. In other words, the reflectivity in the upper part of this cell is very low. The off-path reflectivity in the lower part of the cell is not particularly high as can be seen in this picture where the gain is in the calibrated position and the cell is displayed as yellow off-path. The out-the-window view shows a small convective cell that seems to be lacking in the sharply defined edges that would indicate vigorous convective growth. So everything indicates a very weak convective cell with insufficient reflectivity to display any on-path weather. Remember, if in doubt, look at altitude slices to get a mental picture. This cell was not pushing very much reflectivity aloft. When you see vigorous convective activity, you usually see what we call hard knuckled or color flowered tops is what's shown in this picture. If you see more glaciated tops, which are like these, a wisp, what we call wispy glaciated frozen tops, it generally indicates uh, not very strong convective uh, activity. So in this example, the out the window view shows a mass of cumulus clouds that's not showing any vigorous vertical development. The radar display pictures are showing very little reflectively, mostly off path with the weather at 40 miles. 
even with the gain increased. As we get closer to the weather, it is displayed as off path. This is consistent with weather that is reflectivity only at very low altitudes. Beyond 40 to 100 nautical miles, it's harder for the radar to resolve low level weather from the Earth because the weather is too close to the ground. Here, the radar is able to distinguish the low lying weather from ground and is showing some yellow reflectivity. As with the previous example, the evidence points to weak convection with very low reflectivity aloft. If you're ever in doubt, look at altitude slices. Thank you, and I hope this will help you to better use the RDR 4000 weather radar system. Thanks very much, uh, Stephen, for the for the update there with uh, the operational performance of the RDR 4000 system. Uh, just a quick check of our customers. Again, feel free to type a question into the IM chat window specific to Stephen's presentation, or if you would like to ask a question now, please uh, go ahead and do so. I'll just uh, pause here for a second to see if we do have any customers that are asking questions, Stephen. So uh, just to stand by for a minute, please. All right, will do. OK. I'm not seeing any questions into the IM chat window. So uh, I believe I think we we can move on to the next topic. And again, I would just um, highlight to our customers the presentation. Oh, here we go. A few questions coming in now. <laughs> All right. So I'll take Stephen. I'll read the the two questions out here. I'll take the first one that has come into the inbox here. What is the uh, principle of the RDR four thousand system to detect hail, lightning, and what kind of situation change will make the radar display lightning and hail is the first question please okay um so this isn't really anything new uh, it, it, a lot of the uh, weather agencies do something very similar but what we're without giving away the actual algorithm we're looking at uh, convective weather we're looking at the approximation of where the freezing level is. And again, we're looking at the reflectivity at different altitudes in the atmosphere. And there are certain, based on studies, there are certain conditions that are conducive to the formation of hail and lightning. And then during the uh, development and testing of the radar, uh, we it's very easy to check We uh, because we have uh, ground-based uh, lightning sensors and we had uh, better than I, I believe I think the number was better than 92 or 93 percent correlation to the ground based lightning sensors and I, and I think it's actually better than that because in some cases we predicted lightning where the ground based sensor wasn't showing lightning but uh, about five minutes later there was lightning uh, there so again it's it's basically it's it's not a detection it's a prediction so we're using the information in the buffer um, to predict where those conditions will occur. Right. Um, Excellent. Right. Uh, okay, let's see another one. Um, yeah, right. yeah, I'll just go to the next. Maybe for the question in the middle there from Thomas, I'll just come back to you because that will ultimately tie a little bit into the discussion from Bob Miller. But um, Stephen, I'll just read the third question out. When the climb and descend vertical speed is very fast, should pilot use the main function to detect weather advance? And if yes, how to use, I guess, the manual function is the question there, please. Uh, I would I would say no, because the this you can't climb faster than our computer can figure it out. So um, it can it, you'd have to you'd have to be in a fighter jet to uh, climb uh, so fast that we we couldn't do it so yeah it's actually and i didn't i didn't go into to infinite detail on it but it actually expands the envelope a little bit in the climb or descent to give you a little bit wider buffer than the plus or minus four thousand feet but uh you, you shouldn't you know you're never going to be able to achieve a a vertical speed uh in in any let's, let's put it this way your your passengers would pass out from g-forces before our system wouldn't detect it so that's not really an issue what you would use if you detected something in a climb or a descent is again you know the auto mode is 
It's kind of like the cruise ground park or your detection mode. And if you see something in your path, if we're showing you something in your path, then what you're going to want to do is use the the man. You know, it's called man mode on Boeing. It's called elevation mode on on Airbus. But yeah, you're going to look. You're going to go to that and look at altitude slices, and look at the altitude slices to see how much of that reflectivity is carried aloft, or or if it's you know if it's in your path. So the, the same as if you're in cruise flight. If you're in cruise and you in auto mode detect something in your path, you're going to go to uh, the elevation mode or the man mode and look at altitude slices to try and determine if it's a if it's a hazard that you need to avoid. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Stephen. And then I guess the question from Thomas. Uh, Bob, I think we may just save this for the next presentation, just regarding the Q101 and the service board and 3422 and then 3410 for the TR1, because I think once we get through your presentation, that will ultimately answer the two questions. But, you know, we are looking to drive full effectiveness from our two solutions, software and hardware, into addressing Q101. No two ways about that. So, Bob, if you agree, I think maybe we save this for the end of your materials, if that's all right. Um, that's good. Thanks. OK. Um, all right, um, Andrew, I believe no, I'm not seeing any other questions on those pilot operational style questions. So, Stephen, again, thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated for the presentation today. We are going to move on to the next agenda item, which is the technical aspects of reliability performance and the improvement plan for the RDR 4000 system with specific focus on the TR1 or RTU if you're uh, referring to the Airbus platform. So, Andrew, please. Hello, my name is Bob Miller. I'm an in-service engineer with Honeywell International, and I would like to invite you to a technical and reliability update for the RDR 4000 weather radar system. The enclosed technical data is export classified as 7994 or no license required. The components of the RDR 4000 radar system include the RP1, which is the radar processor located in the electronics bay of the aircraft, the DA1 antenna drive assembly, including the FP30 30-inch flat plate antenna, a control panel, typically a CP1 or CP2, and the transmitter receiver unit, sometimes called the TR1 or RTU. For the purpose of the latter discussion on the improvements for the Q101 voltage regulator reliability issue, there are two solutions, a software solution and a hardware solution. The software solution for the TR1 Q101 reliability is, will be loadable on wing through the RP1. Then the, the code is transferred to the TR1. The hardware solution for the TR1 Q101 reliability is installed in the TR1 at a Honeywell service shop. Current RDR 4000 technical and reliability issues, the 930-2000 uh, 010 for Boeing or 020 TR1 for Airbus. We have hardware and software reliability programs. And also for the older 930-2000-1 and 2 TR1s for Boeing and Airbus platforms, we have a hard hardware reliability program in progress. We have a software solution for the Q101 voltage regulator problem of the TR1. We released a service bulletin on February 18th of 2021, and you can see it's a vendor service bulletin 930-1034-22. Uh, this is loadable on wing on a Boeing aircraft. And then the uh, software is sent from the RP uh, to the TR1 after the loading of the R software in the RP. So that is now available. We also have a software solution currently released for the Airbus single aisle and long range platforms. Service Bulletin 930 1005 was released on October 15th of last year. 
Again, that's available as an on-wing loadable software, like the Boeing side. You load the software uh, into the RP-1 radar processor unit, and then the RP-1 radar processor unit uploads it to the TR-1 transmitter receiver unit. We also have a pending software solution for the Airbus A350 platforms. And currently it's scheduled to be released in February or March of 2022, pending Airbus approvals. Hardware solutions for the TR-1, in which we're replacing the um, current Q101 voltage regulator with a more robust, larger component that provides better heat dissipation. We have a hardware solution for the Boeing platforms already available through Vendor Service Bulletin 930-1034-0010 and that was released in September of last year. For that, the TR-1, uh, when it is under warranty, will be sent to the service shop, and if we find that the transmitter uh, radio frequency board is defective, we'll replace that board, which includes the new Q101 uh, with a new circuit card. The hardware solution for Airbus platforms is still in process. We're progressing well. Uh, we're on schedule still for a March, late March, or uh, possibly early April release of this of a service bulletin uh, for a similar Q101 hardware solution for the TR1 for the Airbus platforms. That would be single aisle long range and for the A350. We also have a, a reliability program in place for the older TR1 units, the 930-2000-1 Legacy for both Boeing and Airbus, and for the uh, older 930-2000-2 uh, original TR1 for the Airbus A350 programs. The engineering investigation for the, uh, the older TR1s is still in progress, and we're now expecting a root cause to be determined by June of 2022, uh, followed by corrective actions. And of course, we'll need to gain approvals from the OEMs, Boeing and Airbus, before release of the vendor service bulletin. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, my, again, my name is Bob Miller, in-service engineer with Honeywell, and I appreciate your time. Have a good day. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Bob, for the uh, for the presentation here today. I guess, uh, Bob, just coming back to the original question from from Thomas on the Q101 um, issue in the weather radar display system, what effectiveness are 3422 and um, 30 foot 10 to solve the problem? So I think you've just gone through that, but just specifically, just a couple of um, points on that uh, question, please. Yes, and thank you, Thomas. It was an, uh, uh, it's an excellent question. Um, first of all, um, I know there's been some concern about, you know, if I have a Q101 problem, would I start to see some slow degradation in the performance of the radar? Usually not. Typically, it's a catastrophic situation where um, the uh, the voltage regulator will be operative and when it when it fails it fails uh, then you would see no weather and you would have a um, you know a WXR fail on the nav display based on you know based on the uh, receiver transmitter unit so it, it really won't affect that um, then as far as the uh, the reliability you know, again, we have the software solution. Uh, the software solution, you definitely want to implement it in your fleet as, as soon as possible. Um, and a couple reasons for that. Number one, if you have current TR1s that have the original radio frequency boards in them with the original Q101, you'll help slow down the process of the um, of the of the solder joint problem. And also if you have a uh, a brand new TR or a brand new repaired TR 
or a spare TR, which of course has a new Q101 voltage regulator, then you'll get the most life out of that. Um, the hardware solution, if we actually do have a failure of the RF board, completely replaces the RF board, which means you have a, a new Q101 transistor, not the original, but larger. It also has a larger footprint on the circuit board for better heat dissipation. And uh, also we'd made some changes to the solderability on the uh, U2 power amplifier uh, integrated circuit. So two, two major improvements, software and hardware. Excellent, thank you. Um, Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. And uh, again, I think for anyone that's watching the IM chat, uh, if you do want to see what the software loading looks like, then we do have two videos that have been posted onto the YouTube channel there. So they contain some some excellent um, detail. I guess I'll just go to the next question there from Jack. So um, I'll just read this out for the Q101 hardware upgrade at the workshop. If a unit is under warranty, can it and can it be force removed for shop upgrade? So if a unit has failed, if a unit is failed, it's covered under warranty. Um, or if the FOC offer is only available for those defective, so that is correct, that statement is correct. This is only for failed or defective units that are removed in the field, then this will be covered under warranty during the shop visit. I think if anyone has any questions that relate to the commercial aspects, please do feel free to reach out to our Honeywell business team and they can certainly provide some additional clarity on the warranty aspects of the service boardings. Uh, Bob, one question that's just uh, come to me on email, it's not in the IM chat, but um, the quick, just the summary of the question is, is there any indication of how many customers have carried out the software loading to date? Is there any clarity we can provide um, specific to that one, please? I, uh, you might be able to help with this, Chris, yep. but I think worldwide, maybe, maybe 25 or 30 percent. Yeah. Total. Yeah, at, at the moment, um, for, for everyone that's on the call here, we've we've loaded um, something in the order of around 350 plus aircraft with the software. Um, and that's, again, that's predominantly um, 737NG related aircraft slash uh, MAX um, and then a few 777s. So on the Boeing side, definitely starting to see um, an uptake in the incorporation status of the service boarding. And we're just starting to have a few customers load the um, Airbus single aisles with the software as we speak. Great, thanks. Um, I'm not seeing any additional questions on the weather radar. So, Bob, I think we can continue. And again, if anyone does have a question at a later stage, please feel free to use the IM chat and we can answer that throughout the rest of the presentation. But the next topic that we're going to move to is the TRA-100B, which is the Honeywell transponder. So, Andrew, please. And I'm here to present the latest technical and reliability updates for the TRA-100B MODUS and ADS-B transponder. Export control notice. The enclosed technical data is export classified as 7994 or no license required. The TRA-100B MODUS transponder, which includes ADS-B functions, is capable of mode A, mode C, and mode S interrogations, and is a critical component of the overall CAS-100 Honeywell TCAS system. Recently, Honeywell has received reports of low reliability for the TRA-100B, and we have an ongoing engineering quality investigation. Even though engineering investigations are still continuing, it has be, been determined that the following subassemblies and circuit cards uh, have a higher than expected failure rate. The AC power supply, the DC power supply, the data processor input output, which is the main processor, and also the radio frequency assembly, which includes the transmitter and receiver functions. All these modules are 
under engineering investigation. Our timeline of events for the investigation. Corrective actions and validation by Honeywell is expected in April of 2022. And based on those results, corrective actions and notice of change to Boeing and an EDIS to Airbus to gain their approvals for any necessary uh, ven vendor service bulletins will occur. That's May of 2022. Thank you, Bob, for the update on the transponder. Um, I did. I have one question um, that's come to me on email, Bob, for the for the transponder. Um, and, and the question just relates to regarding the failure modes for the TRA 100B. Is there any preventive action or fault codes that the customer should be specifically looking for, um, or any other actions that they can they can do to kind of prevent or mitigate against failures? Please. Uh, on these cards, which are um, that I mentioned, not really. Um, one of the main contributors is a uh, power supply power supply issues, and again, it's it's um, when it happens, it's usually catastrophic. Um, there's no slow degradation in the performance of the transponder. Um, there's a, a voltage regulator transistor, and uh, again, when it fails, it fails. So. No, there's no uh, warning fault message or fault code that usually appears. It just stops its normal functioning and then you need to switch to transponder two or transponder one. Excellent. Um, Bob, th this actually just further on to the question that the customer is asking, it, can any from an interface of a TCAS, TR, uh, TCAS computer, is there anything that that could be done on the front face of the TCAS computer, the TPA 100B or um, system that would indicate a fault code of the transponder that would be helpful in the troubleshooting process or or not? Well, there of course is the uh, the indications on the CAS 100 when you uh, you know the TPA 100 TCAS processor. You can go either into the LCD display into the menu and look at the status and internally in the TRA 100B transponder, if it did have a um, an internal failure, it would transmit that status data on the high speed Eric 429 buses back to the TCAS processor. So that would be uh, one way that you would uh, um, know of an impending or you know be able to verify a failure of the transponder part of the TCAS system. Got, okay. And plus, and then of course, um, on the TCAS control panel, you would also get an indication of a of a uh, transponder fail as well. Got it. Now, thank you, but I've just received an acknowledgement. You you've answered the the question specifically, yeah, because I I think they were just looking for the tie up between corresponding messages across the system. So I believe. Just You've you've answered that one, Bob. Thank you. OK, I'm not seeing any additional questions into the IM chat, so I believe we can move to our next topic, which is also presented by Bob, which is the CVR FDR. Andrew, please. We're going to discuss the technical and reliability updates for the HFR5 series of solid state flight data recorders and solid state cockpit voice recorders. Export control notice. The enclosed technical data is export classified as 7E994. No license required. The HFR5 series of recorders includes the HFR5D, D for data, the HFR5D is a crash survivable recording device and records the mandatory flight data and writes that data to a crash survivable memory known as a CSMU, crash survivable memory unit. Problem statement, airlines have been experiencing multiple unscheduled removals of their Honeywell 
HFR 5D flight data recorders due to complete failures on the aircraft. Initial testing found that the 115 volt AC input circuits were opening. The power supply board known as the system controller and power supply board, which has a has the uh, problem with the power supply section is common to both the HFR5 FDRs and HFR5 series CVRs. Both types of recorders have the potential for this particular failure mechanism. Potential corrective actions for the HFR5D, which are currently under continued engineering investigation. A root cause for the 115 volt input failures are due to cracking and shorting MLCCs. MLCCs are multi-layer ceramic capacitors. We're moving to a new type of flex lead capacitor, which will solve this problem. Also, we're installing a more robust version of a rectifier diode. And we're going to also install some more robust inrush resistors, which act like fuses on the 115 volt line. The HFR5 series also includes an HFR5V or cockpit voice recorder. Very similar to the flight data recorder version. It includes a crash survivable memory unit. The recorder obtains audio information from three cockpit microphones and a wide area microphone in the aircraft. And it is also capable of recording CPDLC or data link and recording that on a sub channel as well. Along with time stamp information. Problem statement for the HFR5V. These recorders were found with defective crash survivable memory units upon annual inspection. It was observed that some of the CVRs had only 10 minutes of recording time instead of two hours. And it was found that internally the crash survivable memory unit was not properly communicating with the main processor on the system controller and power supply circuit guard assemblies. Potential corrective actions. A bond or stiffener, as you can see by the diagram, uh, is has been recommended to be uh, as part of the um, header connector that the CSMU uh, attaching cable connects to the system controller and power supply board to make that little board more rigid so that uh, it does not cause cracking of solder connections. The timeline, we're predicting entry into service of any corrections after approvals of Knox and Edis's for Boeing and Airbus to allow us to submit any necessary Vendor service bulletins will occur no later than November of 2022. Thank you for your attention and have a good day. Thank you, Bob, for the uh, presentation. I have one question. There's no questions in the IM chat, but um, I've got one that's come to me on email here, the, and this relates to I guess the configuration change that's going to occur once we release the service bulletins, is there a part number role for the CVR and FDR fix is the question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's uh, still a little early to determine that. Um, my guess is on the Boeing would be a, a hardware mod or mods and but on the Airbus, I'm not sure if uh, there would be a requirement for a part number role or part number roles there. So it's just still a little too early yet to make that determination. We're still negotiating with Boeing and Airbus. Excellent. All right, thank you. Thanks, Bob. Uh, again, no questions on the IM chat. So 
I think we can continue on here. And our next topic is going to be the uh, gyro wear out discussion from Mark Lyles, our in-service engineer. Um, so Andrew, please. Hello, my name is Mark Lyles. I'd like to talk to you today about IRU proactive gyro replacements. The IRU provides attitude, velocity, and autonomous position references for flight controls, displays, and various other systems. The ADRU provides these functions as well as the air data function. For simplicity, this presentation will refer to both the ADRU and IRU devices simply as the IRU. Honeywell IRUs are equipped with the GG1320AN gyro. It has been manufactured since 1996 under various part numbers. Most IRUs contain three gyros, the X, Y, and Z gyro, each sensing a rotation around the corresponding axis of the aircraft. Note that the Boeing 777-FT-8 RU is an exception to this three gyro count as it uses six gyros, and the Boeing 777-SARU uses four gyros. So what's inside these gyros? Well, they contain an enclosed optical cavity that's filled with a precise mixture of gases used as the lasing medium. They also contain mirrors, electrodes, and optical detectors used to sense changes in light beam frequency, which is a direct measure of angular motion. These laser gyros have been proven to be very reliable, stable, and accurate for years of operation, but do have wearout mechanisms that ultimately limit their operational life. So what is gyro wear out? Well, gyro wear out is a condition in which after many years of operating, the gyro output decreases to a point where the IRU system declares itself as failed. It is the primary driver of IRU failures. It occurs after many years of power on operation, not just light time. The IRU declares itself as faulted when laser output reaches a minimum operational threshold. The gyro's end of life phase is referred to as the gyro wearout phase and is characterized as a rapidly decreasing laser intensity, but one that is still above the minimum. Once the wearout phase has started, the gyro is most likely to fail quickly in days or maybe a couple months. Note that there is no indication on the aircraft that the IRU contains gyros in the wearout phase of life. The IRU will continue to operate until device level bite declares an IRU fault. Note that for certain Airbus ADRUs, there is a new feature that's available called the Gyro Life Monitor. The Gyro Life Monitor is currently being introduced in the HG2030AE25 and HG2030AE45 ADRUs. It provides an indication of flight and maintenance crews when one or more gyros in the ADRU have an estimated 300 to 500 operating hours remaining before failing due to end of life. This preemptive indication is intended to prevent interruptions to revenue service and allow airlines to schedule at their convenience a time to repair or replace data room. Remember, gyros eventually wear out. They don't have an unlimited lifespan and will typically wear out after many years of service. Frequently, when an IRU is sent in for repair due to a failed gyro, only the single failed gyro is replaced. The remaining gyros may also be near end of life, and if not also replaced, will result in limited operational hours before the next gyro failure. Let's take a look at an in-service scenario. Initially, all gyros in the IRU have the same power on times. In this case, the first gyro fails at 65,000 hours due to wear out. It's removed from the aircraft, sent to the shop, repaired, and put back in service. 5,000 hours later, the second gyro fails due to wear out. Again, the unit is removed, sent to the repair shop, and put back into service. After just 2,000 more operating hours, the third gyro fails due to wear out. And again, it's removed and sent to the shop. The result is three distinct IRU failures, three distinct IRU removals, and three shop visits. 
So let's consider a proactive approach. If all three gyros were replaced at the first stop visit, two atrial replacements and their associated schedule interruptions could have been avoided. Note that Honeywell provides two service information letters with useful information regarding gyro life and proactive gyro replacement. The document numbers are listed here and are available on our technical publication website. Note that after implementing a proactive gyro replacement plan, a major operator realized over 100% improvement in their MTBF. Honeywell offers multiple repair and support solutions to meet the varying needs of the operators and include time and material, tiered flat rate contract, gyro exchange contract, maintenance services agreement, and maintenance services agreement with gyro soft pull option. Contact your Honeywell customer business team to discuss options regarding IRU maintenance in your fleet. So here's some tips to assist in managing gyro wear out. First, track gyro hours in each IRU. Develop a gyro tracking spreadsheet to record gyro hours in your fleet. Request gyro hours be included in the shop repair reports and update your spreadsheet with that information. Review your spare IRUs. Note the gyro hours in your spare hardware. Ensure that spares have gyro hours well short of the gyro wear out period. This will reduce the likelihood of early removals after installation of the spare. Also, manage IRU power on time. During overnights, turn the IRU to the off mode. So here's a, a brief uh, discussion on a gyro tracking spreadsheet. The inputs are the operational hours of your fleet for the year and the entry of the gyro hours that were reported in the last drop reports. The output of this model is going to be an estimation of the current gyro operating time. And through this, you can highlight any gyros that have operating times over a preset threshold that you've decided on. Okay, well, that's all that I have for you prepared in the presentation. So at this point, we're open to uh, any questions that you may have. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, excellent presentation there. And I, uh, just while we're waiting for any questions that come in, um, you know, I would say for those customers that are 737NG related, um, typically if you look at the top 10 Boeing Ds and Cs, you'll, you'll definitely see the HG2050 moving up there from an age driver perspective. So the presentation uh, hopefully really resonates with, uh, with all of you on the call today. Uh, Mark, just I, I do have a question that's come to me on email, and this one is relating to the Airbus gyro life function. Um, the customer is asking, is there is there any additional documentation from Airbus, or has Honeywell issued a service information letter that provides a little bit more context about the gyro life function, please? Okay, at, uh, right now, the only information that we have from Honeywell is what's um, contained in the Honeywell service bulletin for those upgrades. We do, however, have a knowledge article uh, on the topic that is available through the portal uh, that, that gives uh, a little bit additional detail. And I believe Airbus is working on further communication. I know that there's been a, a dialogue with, with our engineering group um, to, to get to get it more information, so it appears that something is is pending, but I don't have a date for that yet. No worries, thank you, Mark. And and for the customers that are on the call, the knowledge article or knowledge based system uh, is where this particular um, information can be found. So we can certainly share that uh, uh, to all of the customers on the line, and I'll share that specifically with the the uh, customer that's emailed me. Okay, Mark, it looks like we've got one question and this is probably mixed here, so we may not be able to answer all of this because some of this is commercial related, so we may take an action in that regard. But the first one, the first question is, is there an Adaroo performance parameter that we can use to predict when the gyro is about, is about to enter the gyro wear out phase or state? Is the first question, Mark, um, the second one is, does Honeywell have an attractive program to replace all three gyros at the first shop visit for 
that part of the question, we can certainly engage our Honeywell business team. But Mark, for question number one, please. Okay, so uh, on the aircraft, uh, with the exception of the gyro life monitor feature that was just mentioned, and again, that's just uh, being introduced for the Airbus 2030A ADRU. So with the exception of that, that single model, there is no way that we can detect the gyro wear out phase on the aircraft. If your uh, airline has its own test capability, for certain models of the IRU devices, uh, you're able to, to read an analog parameter on the test bench that, that is an indication of that laser intensity. So if it is in the shop, you can read that. And uh, again, for certain models, it will give you an indication. That information is contained in the component maintenance manual uh, for, for that particular model. So. Uh, Again, it's it's a, a model by model, or I should say a part number by part number specific feature. And again, it's only in the shop. Thanks very much, Mark. And then for item number two, again, we may reach out. Uh, we'll have our business team reach out directly. Okay, uh, Mark, I'm not seeing any other questions relating to the uh, gyro discussion. Again, thank you. Uh, we are going to move to our final presentation, which is a short update on our product reliability page on the MyRospace portal. Um, I do ask uh, for any customers, we have posted a survey chat uh, form into the window there. Um, we do ask you complete the survey because the feedback is important. So, Andrew, let's go to the final presentation, please. My name is Ashu Mehta. I am a Honeywell Aerospace Field Service Engineer working in customer and product support. Today, I'm going to show you an enhancement on the Honeywell My Aerospace portal, which gives you access to product reliability updates. Firstly, you must log into the My Aerospace portal with your user ID and password. From the landing page, if you already have shortcuts selected, you can say select technical support. If not, select services and support. You'll see a number of drop downs and you need to select support. From the next set of drop downs, you select technical support. On the technical support page, you will see that we have many technical support tools available, including training videos and publications. In this instance, we want product reliability updates. We are pleased to announce a new feature on our product reliability update page. You can now subscribe to receive updates whenever a new presentation is posted. From the product reliability update page, select subscribe to updates. Populate the form with your details. Tick the checkbox and submit. You will now receive notification every time new reliability presentation is posted. I hope you found this short video helpful. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Ash, for that uh, presentation. And again, just a reminder for all of our customers, the product reliability page is a new feature. So uh, we do ask that you check check out the page specifically because we are um, using this quite extensively now to promote and communicate any of our existing reliability or fleet open issues that um, are currently impacting our airline customers. That does conclude our 
uh, presentations for today. Um, I would like to thank all of the presenters and I would like to thank all of our airline customers uh, that have joined our first webinar for uh, 2020. It's certainly been a, a great pleasure as your host uh, to be able to conduct today's sessions. If there are any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to me in the IM chat here um, or contact our area tech support team at uh, any opportunity. This presentation and event has been recorded. You will receive an invitation to be able to view the recording uh, that will be sent out within the next 24 hours. And again, thank you for all of you joining today and our presenters. If there's any questions, please do let me know. Um, how do we describe only for the system updates? At the moment, um, the page is set up so you will receive updates across the full product line. We are looking to narrow the focus of the system to be able to sub specifically subscribe to those individual systems that you may be interested in. Uh, and that feature is definitely coming soon. Okay. All right, uh, guys, I'm not seeing any additional questions into the IM chat. Uh, I do have the one action there. I will contact that customer specifically on the Adaroo. And uh, again, a very good morning, good afternoon or good evening. Thank you for joining Honeywell's presentation today.